Good evening, one and all. Happy Thursday. That means it's time to blind taste some wine. Who's with us this evening for this lovely little red wine? I think it might be a little bit bigger than a little red wine. A wine with some, some density, some potential power here, maybe. That's the initial thought. Who's here tonight? I got a chance to see Matthew today. I don't know if he's joining us tonight this evening, but he was in uh, one of our regular contributors to this Thursday evening wine tasting. He was in this lunch for lunch today, buying a couple wines for future tastings. But uh, Molly White's with us this evening, Chris Shirley, and Adrian really is with us this evening. I think Jeff is off and away. I got to see them last night as they helped us break in our inaugural evening of cabana service, uh, new cabana service, I should say, which was great. I'm very appreciative that they ventured out as did every, as along with everyone else last night who braved really cold temperatures to try those out. Tony's with us tonight. Uh, the Beckers are here. Susan's here this evening. Isabel's here. I'm sorry I missed you earlier. Kristen, hi. Um, how exciting. That's great. And Molly's here right now, <laughs> um, which is really cool. And Kathy's with us this evening. Good. Kathy, pleasure uh, to taste with you, of course, last week, Thursday, but also um, again on Friday with the Walsh's. That was a lot of fun. And you nailed those wines. No surprise. Uh, Nicole and Stephen are with us. The Burses are here. Lorna and Craig are with us tonight. This is awesome. All right, guys, gals. Ooh, what are we doing? <clears throat> Looks like a red. Ha. And what do you see as you're starting to take this wine in? Zach and Megan are here. Hi there. Good evening. Klaus. Hey, man. Good evening to you. Um, Sheila's joining us this evening. And Rob and Kathy are here tonight. I love seeing that uh, little icon above your name, Robert. Uh, it comes out top fan, which um, who would have known, you know, that we would have fans in this world of restaurants, but that's fantastic. And Matthew, yes, thanks for watching tonight and wonderful to see you. Rick Tag is also watching this evening. I have to say, as a quick aside, Rick, everybody's a big fan. Um, we were going over kind of a menu mix today. The menu mixes the percentages of uh, menu items that sell on a menu. And Rick wonderfully contr contributed to uh, one of the most popular lunch items that we have presently, which is the barbecue bowl. So we're serving barbecued pork and uh, collard greens that are mixed with grape leaves, some, some stewed um, baked beans, and some of our cornbread pudding. And uh, Rick's contribution to this fantastic dish is that he gave us some grape juice right off the press, which we turned into a barbecue sauce. So, um, and Chris is saying already that he had past tense. This one is a good one tonight and that he had it already. So you finished it. Are you ready to, did you save a little bit to taste? You've had it with steak, which is a good call. I think that might be a great call as I'm smelling it more and more. And Jan saying, yum. Um, great. All right, folks, what do you see? And in Chris's taste, uh, sense or Chris's perspective already, what have you tasted already? But let's talk about visual. For those of you that don't have it, it's pretty dark in color. <laughs> Matthew's talking about a difficult time he's had in, in getting anything other than the umami burger, which is understandable. And I'm glad you have a little bit to play with, Chris. Very good. Kristen, thank you for starting us off. Deep purple, clear, yes. Craig, Craig's picking up on some raisins, some licorice, some cloves. Um, Adrian's saying that she finds some ruby color here. Yep, I think we're in between ruby and, and purple. Um, I'm a little bit more ruby on my side here as I'm trying to evaluate this particular wine. Uh, with the darker core that hedges on a little bit of purple, and yes. Um, Yvette's noticing a little bit of garnet. Do you see a little variation on the rim? Yeah, there's a touch, right? Um, there looks to be a little bit of an interesting kind of variation from the rim color, and when I'm saying rim, I mean the outside edge versus what you see more toward the center part of the, the wine itself. And if you're looking at that in a wine, any variation in that might tell you uh, or might give you an indication of perhaps wine age. So it might have some age. Um, a really kind of clear meniscus on around the outside that called meniscus, that little rim edge. 
it's very clear, it might be an indication of, of greater alcohol. Um, so something you can learn certainly from looking at the wine in that regard. Jan's noting jammy. Uh, Jonathan saying it's dark, hold it to the light. Um, are you saying that to me? Uh, I apologize if that's the case. I can't really give you much more light than that. But um, yeah, if you hold it to the light, it's, uh, it is pretty dark. If you hold it above a white page and then look at your uh, some print below it, do you see the print? And while you can really look, you, if you look very closely, yeah, you can. But if you look kind of just generally above it, it's, it's gonna be something that's a little bit um, richer and intense in color, right? I mean, its appearance is on that ruby to, to purple spectrum. There seems to be a little bit of potential tawny and kind of at the very rim. Um, and it's a bold wine, or at least a medium wine, medium plus maybe. Um, hmm. Okay, so what do you smell? Does it smell clean? Do you smell any faults? Smell anything to kind of con cause for concern? Or do you dive right into, um, into aromas that, I remember how we've broken that down in the past, fruit, earth, wood, a few aromas. Do they have, does it have fruit? Does it have earth? Does it have wood notes? So on the fruit side, do you smell anything fruited? Mm. Jan, I love that comment. It smells like high alcohol, which is awesome. That kind of comment would denote a certain expression of fruit quality that would probably, Jan, you chime in otherwise, but would mean riper fruit. And as a result, the riper fruit giving you an indication that you have a warmer climate. Warmer climate may be giving you an indication of then higher alcohol. High alcohol leads to all of that. So with the smell, we're already building a profile here. Raspberry, black cherry, cherry from Ann uh, McCarty, which is great. Earthy and smoke coming off of, uh, for, off of the wine for Jan Nelson. Um, and so we're talking about some darker cherry quality, a little bit of a raisiny element from Yvette. And Yvette, going back to kind of that rim variation and that tawny element, raisins might be an indication of something of, of a riper climate. Um, and maybe also potentially some age where you're getting a, uh, a wine that has that variation and some of its fruit character is transforming into something a little bit more dried. Black cherries, vanilla, some pepper, not black, more pyrazine pepper. So bell pepper kind of quality, like a, a green bell pepper perhaps is what Kathy's noting. Craig is asking figgy um, and that's an interesting call too. So a little bit of fig element coming back into this particular wine, yeah. All right, let's taste this um, and see. But before we do, actually, I should I should pause. Are you are you smelling anything earthy? I mean, and we got a little bit of earth before, but earthy, fruit, earth, wood, anything earthy coming through for anybody else? And then more particularly, wood. Do you smell any wood notes, spices, things of that sort uh, that might be here that we can look for and try to verify as we taste the wine? Hmm. Perfume coming from Rick. Not from Rick's person, but from the wine that Rick is smelling. Excuse me, Rick. Yeah, definitely a little bit of that. Yeah, but anybody else picking up kind of um, a wintergreen, winter mint kind of note? Are you smelling oak? Uh, a tiny bit of charred wood from Susan. Jan's picking up a little bit of oak. Mm. Yeah. Some purple flowers uh, noted Kathy and, and Chris is noting, of course, some licorice, cedar from uh, Adrian. So wood elements that are present on the nose all right, taste it if you haven't already, or if you have already, go ahead again and taste it. And let's go through, see if we can't pick up some of those fruit characteristics on this and if, if the oak showing through. And for me, I just tasted a little bit. And yes, there's a definite presence of some oak and some fruit tannin here. Um, 
showing right off the bat. And so that leads you to a discussion about, leads us to a discussion about the, the overall weight uh, and that weightiness giving us an indication perhaps uh, of varietal, right? Or varieties that it might be. Chris is saying this evolved quite a bit since it's opened about an hour ago. Yep. And Kathy, it does have tannins. Going back to your comment, Anne, about cedar. Cedar, yeah, is a good indication of French oak. And so that's something that we should consider as we look at this. And that can also give us some, some nods toward what this might be, uh, or certainly can help us to verify toward the finish what it might be. Um, Rick, you're picking up some candy cherries in the palette. Kathy's concurring with Chris about the changes. What kind of changes are you guys experiencing? Are they, have the tannins softened or dissipated? Has the wine just opened much more? Kristen's saying she decanted about 30 minutes ago and the tannins are pretty smooth now. So you just answered my question, thank you. Tannins and acid, tannins and acid. Uh, Adrian's noting, yes, 100%. So what can we kind of begin to rule out? Let's, let's talk about what it's not right off the bat before we get into what it might be. Um, and that helps to kind of help create the guide posts or the guide rails that we will work within. Um, it has softened a bit, Chris is noting from, uh, from the hour, but being open and, and Rick saying a bit of medicinal quality. So from that candied fruit to a medicinal quality. So this fruit has a little bit of warmth to it. Jonathan's asking about the minerality on this. I'm not getting a tremendous amount of minerality. Um, it's more about that fruit and the fruit in its various forms. Um, and Yvette, I missed most of that comment there. I think you saying something about it leading to French oak. Um, it's not Pinot Noir, right? That's exactly right. So it's not Gamay, it's not Pinot Noir. It's uh, likely not, say, Sangiovese. Um, it's probably not uh, things that are on the lighter end of the spectrum are on the thinner skinned varieties that would give you a little bit less tannin, generally speaking. Um, and so, this is a wine that has a bit more tannin and structure. Great, so we're already on sort of the, the more bold, robust side of things. Um, thicker skin varieties, right? Medium bodied wines to full bodied wines is probably where we're sitting, or at least should be considering. And we smelled alcohol from the beginning, um, and are we tasting alcohol right now? Let's talk about intensity. Is this a medium wine? or medium plus wine or a robust wine? Where does it sit in the, the vein of that sort of, now in this case, sort of 2% to whole milk quality? John, thank you for that. 67 Chevy Minerality. And I love that you're playing this from one of our cabanas. That's awesome. Um, yeah, this is a Malbec or a Zin kind of level of, of intensity. I think those two varietals we should be considering. Medium to medium plus, Chris is noting in terms of intensity. I think if you're able to separate the tannin from the actual experience of the wine, maybe it's a medium weight wine, but the tannins are a bit more aggressive, more powerful, right? So maybe medium plus tannins and a medium weight wine. Um, it's warm, that's for sure. Um, Melanie, you noted that right. Uh, and Robert, yeah, medium body, Jeff and Adrian in medium wine. So a medium alcohol, it's not burning, right? So if you think about taking a shot of tequila or vodka, maybe bourbon, but something clear, you have this kind of burn um, on, the, uh, on the back end of your throat, usually from the higher alcohol. I'm not getting that from this particular wine. I haven't swallowed it though, um, but it's not... I'm not kind of breathing that fire. It's there, there's a, there's a definite quality of alcohol um, that's on this wine because it's riper and it has that, that element. It's wearing that alcohol pretty well, though, if it is a higher alcohol wine. And Chris, to your question, yeah, uh, it's being proven right now by the, the, the Bonos who are outside um, in Cabana 211 playing this game. Great winter red, that's a great descriptor, Jan, yes. It has nice acid on the finish, it's a lengthy finish by way of the acidity. <laughs> Peter, I, we did not give you a DRC. We can rule that out. Um, we're pretty amazing. 
I think we're, we're great folks and we're very generous of spirit for sure, but I don't think we could be that generous and probably not get enough of it uh, to be able to, to dole it out in this, in this setting. Domaine de la Romani Conti is what we're talking about in the way of DRC, a wine from Burgundy that makes some of the best highly regarded and most expensive wine on the planet. Uh, Mara's watching with us this evening. Hi, Mara. Welcome. Excited to see you with us this evening, too. Um, okay, so Zin, Malbec, something along those lines we're starting to think about. This is a medium-bodied, medium-plus bodied wine with medium-plus tannin with medium, medium-plus acidity. We're talking about a wine then that would be sort of in the the Merlot kind of category, the Malbec category, the Zin category, maybe Shiraz category, um, all of that kind of varietal as opposed to sort of Gamay, Sangiovese, Pinot Noir, things of that sort of, that sort of ilk. Um, so, Kathy's throwing out there a Bordeaux grape. Yeah, I just threw out Merlot as an option. Um, we could be talking about a blend, and how do we kind of parse out blend versus single varietal? Where do you think this wine falls, and what do you know about this wine from tasting it that would indicate varietal or multi-varietal or blend? Molly's saying that she thinks this is New World Merlot. Isabel's asking about Petite Syrah, uh, or saying Petite Syrah. That's very interesting. Yeah, you could get Petite Syrah, you know, dark dark character, maybe a little bit darker than this. The jammy elements and the and the, the, uh, the fruit character is very interesting. Um, so we're all over the map with this one, this is good. We've got Old World Thoughts from Chris, we've got New World Quality uh, from Molly and others. Robert's thinking it's varietal, it's pretty straightforward. I think that's probably true. I'm not picking up a lot of dimension from this that would usually indicate uh, a whole series of different quality uh, flavors. Um, Malbec was another Nebbiolo. So there is a lot of tannin here. Uh, Nebbiolo would be an interesting call, maybe a new world Nebbiolo. I don't know this would be old world. Chris is throwing out uh, Garnacha or Tempranillo, so Spanish production, giving you that so this is where that Spanish production, Garnacha certainly from somewhere else, Tempranillo perhaps from somewhere else other than Rioja, because Rioja would probably give you more of a signature of American oak, and that cedared element would be more American, although there are some producers using small French barrique, the smaller French oak barrels. Um, we had a little bit of raisin character, which would potentially take you to Spain. Could also take you to Portugal. Um, remember way back when we had a little Portuguese red, uh, Dwarl red, that definitely showed some more of that raisiny character. Rick's saying Petit Verdot blend. That would be really neat and interesting. It's more elegant than power, Susan's noting. So yeah, it's starting to change a little bit, right? I'm getting more than just the fruit aroma. It's 718, so it's beginning to change a little bit ahead of our typical schedule, where 722 to 724, the wines begin to say, to evolve and change. Um, I'm getting a little more earthen element on the nose right now. Back to Kathy's Bordeaux varietal. Kathy, do you think it's one varietal from Bordeaux? Are you thinking Merlot like Molly, or are you thinking more Cabernet, Petit Verdot like Rick? Tempranillo is a good guess. A few of you are definitely on the Tempranillo train, so are you thinking Tempranillo from Spain? That has a little bit of that earth in the element. It has that warmth, it has some of that medicinal quality, it has cherry and the darker fruit. Yeah. That tannin is, is very present still. So Tempranillo can present tannin like this and Cabernet can present some tannin like this. And I think that's where I was just headed, Chris, is, is asking, we've talked about different 
wines in the context of just a feel or a flair, as you put it, for a particular place. And wow, the tannins are just bonding. They're almost gluing my tongue, my, my uh, lip, excuse me, to my teeth. They're present pretty substantially. Um, Jonathan's throwing out Rioja, um, and Stephen's saying that Spain is what he thought when he first smelled it. So there's, we've had wines before where it's like, that's Italian. This is more Spanish. This smells like, you know, New World Chardonnay, for example, or whatever it might be. And this has that element of a combination of that tannin and that acid uh, with the fruit character. So you get tannin, acid, and ripeness. Um, uh, John's asking too about one of those very delicious light priorats that we serve. Yeah, there's an absolute chance that this could have some priorat character to it. Um, probably less Tempranillo than in that context, but perhaps. Um, we've done priorat in this tasting before, and using the Chris Shirley method, we would say that we probably are not likely to repeat a wine, um, but it's possible. Um, and it's definitely possible when it's me picking, because I, I'm not necessarily attuned to what Tony and, and Julie might be picking. Um, I can't remember, have we done Rioja? I don't recall, oh, we did do a Rioja, I think. We did a Muga or something to that effect. Um, but nevertheless, it's still a possibility, or we could be thinking about a different uh, Tempranillo from somewhere else in Spain. Hey, Cooper, how are you, sir? Good evening, welcome. And Jan's saying she thinks, but more appropriately, me thinks, Cabernet or Zind, uh, a Zin uh, sorry, a Zinfandel. So Zinfandel, I don't know that, I could be very wrong here, Kat, uh, Jan, that, but the Zin would be a little less tannic in this way. I mean, it would have tannin, but I don't know that it would be as aggressive. Um, but Cabernet, yes. And if it was Cabernet, where? So, Kathy, you threw out Bordeaux varietal and you said ca Cabernet. Um, and if it was Cabernet, but not from Bordeaux, because it wouldn't come as a single varietal really as Cabernet, where would we go? Maybe we'd be in some place like Monsant in Spain. That would give us Tempranillo and maybe Garnacha mixed in. That's a good call. Adrian, yeah. And it kind of re references back to Chris Shirley's point about uh, Grenache Monastrel. Um, that's a very interesting call, Nicole. I mean, Stephen, via Stephen. Um, that's pretty cool. Monastrel coming from Spain. Yeah, why not? Um, the tannins there, right? Um, man, the tannins really there. It's just bonding for me. Um, Isabel is saying if it's cab, she thinks maybe Australian. I think that's a pretty cool guess for an, Aust an Aussie cab. And um, I was thinking about Chile for a minute, and I don't know that this is necessarily Chile. This could be something like, I don't know, you know, Barossa cab or McLaren Vale cab, perhaps. Um, Kathy's liking the Spain call, and we know the rules of this trade tasting. If Kathy likes a particular call, we should probably go that route. I've, I've defied that in the last few tastings with her, and I've suffered the consequences. So, um, which then brings Jan back to Shiraz. Um, so if it's Shiraz, do you get any black pepper? Do you get a little bit of that leathery element? Do you get some smoky meats? Um, I picked up on that winter mint, kind of uh, winter green for just a second, but it's not hanging as much uh, in this in this wine. I like the Monastrell idea. I like the Spanish red call too. I think it's kind of a, a wine that has potential here. Kathy's saying with Monastrell, she thinks you'd expect a little bit more meat. Yeah, I'm not picking up a whole bunch of meat there either. Um, Chris is definitely leaning Tempranillo. So either leaning Rioja Tempranillo, Chris, or something else. And Robert, you're, you're correct in noting Kathy's our muse. No pepper. Yeah, I'm not getting a bunch of pepper here. So pepper sort of takes away Syrah um, or puts Syrah kind of out of the camp, but it doesn't necessarily take away Grenache or Garnacha. Uh, and Tempranillo, the tannin is what we have to kind of explain and I think think about. Hey, Chris. 
Chris Rutten's with us this evening. Hi, how are you guys? Um, that tannin, you know, if you look at, I brought this chart again tonight, but something bolder and richer, um, like perhaps uh, from the Spanish side of things, you know, you're looking at, um, where do they put Tempranillo on this? I'm looking at it through this. So Tempranillo is kind of in the middle where we were kind of describing this as sort of a medium bodied wine, wine with uh, tannins, Infidel sitting right above that. Um, Nebbiolo can have that kind of tannin, but we're not seeing that. Malbec could have that kind of tannin, but we're not necessarily tasting Malbec here. So um, Chris is saying possibly Ribera de Duero, which I think is a cool call. Yeah. I think it's a really good call. Um, and probably where I'd be comfortable to kind of, to plant a flag. Um, a Spanish Ribera de Duero, Tempranillo based wine. Maybe there's a little bit of a, kind of an addition of some other varietals, but principally a Tempranillo wine. So let's talk a little bit about age, because we talked for a second in the beginning about a tiny bit of um, rim variation and maybe a tawning element. Kathy's noting too for us though that cherry, fig, cedar, tannins kind of back up the Tempranillo call. Yep, and I think that's pretty cool. Um, and straight lines are getting hard, aren't they? Yes, yes. Chris, that's 100% true. Um, so do you taste an evolution in the tannin? Do you taste an evolution in the fruit to think about this wine being aged? Does this wine have an aged element to it or is it more youthful? And mm. It smells and pretty much tastes more youthful. Uh, and Molly, thank you. I understand you have to go. They were doing this in the, the cabana, as I mentioned, and they were doing it with their young daughter, who's awesome. She's a great guest of ours. We'll see you next time and hopefully do this again. Um, yeah, Robert, you nailed it. I think it, it tastes, or it has a tawny rim, but it tastes young. I think that's the case. Um, and Craig, yeah, three to five years. Um, so Chris is also noting that four to five years old. Yeah, it has a... It has the room to grow and room to kind of work those tannins or integrate them. Those are still pretty youthful and powerful in this case. So yeah, let's talk about three to five years puts us probably in something like this 2018, but really more likely 17, 16, maybe 15. It's got some power. I, I like the 16, 17 call on this. Mm. Cool. It is still maintaining that tannin. Yeah, this is a youthful wine. I'm gonna edge more toward the three year side of things. I'm gonna say like 16 or 17, three or four years. Maybe more 17. Um, good wine, well put together. It has quality to it. Those tannins are, are real. The fruit got ripe, but they're not like the, the fruit character hasn't been pushed into a supreme ripeness where you just have this crazy overwhelming quality to it. All right, anybody want to posit a guess? I know Chris, you seem like you were on Roberto de Duero or Tempranillo Spain from Rioja. Jan's throwing out 16 or 17. Jan, are you throwing that out with Shiraz, with Cabernet from uh, Australia? Where are you at? Um, I'm pretty comfortable with the Tempranillo call. And I'll go Roberto de Duero. I think that's a cool idea. Um, Yvette saw the year on the bottom of the cork, <laughs> so keeping quiet. Okay, fair enough, I appreciate that. Yep, um, good value at 25 bucks for sure. Agreed there, uh, Chris. Love a great value in wine. So yeah, let's go with this. I'm gonna do Spain. I'm gonna do Tempranillo-based wine. I think strongly Tempranillo, and um, we'll say 2000 and I think with the youth of it, I'm gonna say 17. Um, and I like the, the regional call of Ribera de Duero. So we'll go with that for me. Kristen's in the same camp. Jan's going cab from Australia from 2017 or 16. Um, anybody else wanna put their idea out there? Especially if it diverges from that one or that I just uh, mentioned or that seemingly others are, are putting out there. You can go ahead, you can be different. You can be right. 
as the rest of us are wrong or vice versa. It doesn't matter. You've got wine in your glass and we spend some time together. We can't lose. Mm -hmm. It's just getting more and more interesting. That earth element's peeking through more and the tannins are still there, but the fruit's still playing and it's kind of the, the fruit's been inflated a little bit more. It's really nice. All right, Jen, she's throwing out New World uh, Nebbiolo. Cool. It's got the tannin power for it, for sure. Um, and that'd be interesting. So maybe a California Nebbiolo or um, maybe a Virginia Nebbiolo. Um, so Kathy's thrown out a rogue guess, a 2016 Garnacha Priorat, which would be pretty cool. Um, and Adrian's definitely confirming Tempranillo. So I think we're in a good spot. We've got a few interesting guests jumping around with guesses that are elsewhere. <laughs> but she's, Kathy's giving us Garnacha as a guess, but still uh, a, uh, she's a dual bet on Tempranillo. Um, Uh, yes, Chris, it, it definitely has um, some fruity notes. A little bit jammy, a little bit medicinal, some candied fruit notes. It has medium weight body, but a kind of medium plus tannin, medium plus acidity. Um, it has cherry flavors, dark cherry flavors, and those flavors also range into that medicinal element and the candied element. You have uh, earthy elements, which are emerging more and more now with some time, and wood elements in the way of some cedar. So a pretty cool wine, um, nevertheless, and as, as is pointed out, a definite value wine at $25. Ready? Here we go. This is Rioja, a Reserva from 2015. So this is mostly Tempranillo, of course. This is 14.5% alcohol, so this is a big boy. Um, it has all that power, it's wearing it well, um, and Reserva is giving us a wine that has a little bit of age, which is great. So um, I don't, I think we had done Rioja before, but that's cool. Um, yeah, Chris, completely blind. That's great. It's kind of fun to play it completely blind based on the, the, uh, the input from the group. But um, nope, this might have a little bit of Garnacha, maybe some Graciano, something of that sort, Mazuela in it. But this is Tempranillo from Spain, 2015. So guys, we did a great job getting Tempranillo and great job identifying Spain. Um, I think I swayed us perhaps more than anybody else from Rioja. I think many of you were probably closer to that. Um, I wasn't getting more of the American oak part and I don't know whether this producer uses uh, more French oak, but it certainly doesn't taste uh, more American. So it's a pretty cool wine. It's really uh, a nice wine for, as you pointed out, Chris, for the value. This is great. I think we have some bottles left. For those of you that would like to, to keep a little bit of this, and I would love to keep this for three years, five years, and forget about it, and then pop that open for a fun evening, a Friday night wine that you'd just be probably really happy with. It would showcase itself in a couple of years. Certainly, I, as I, a number of you pointed out, benefits from about an hour plus of decanting, and I think if you have any left in it and you don't care to drink it tonight, leave it on the counter and cork it and come back tomorrow and see what it's doing because I bet it's gonna be pretty cool tomorrow as it just kind of evolves a touch more. And John, I'm so glad you're happy and it is good, uh, quite good as Adrian puts it. Yvette calls it delicious, so that's fantastic. Another good selection by Tony uh, and one that uh, brings us a great value. He's been scouring the, the world of wine um, and trying to bring us wines of value that give us a challenge. I think we're in for some more challenges to come um, by way of some varietals that are unique and interesting. And then I've got a couple wines that I picked out for kind of, a, I think we're headed toward them in February. For those of you that don't know, we have wines already selected basically through February. Next week, if I'm looking at the, if I'm thinking of the calendar correctly, I think next week is the last tasting we'll do for this year because Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve both fall on Thursday and we'll be pretty busy here at the restaurant. And so we won't do these tastings those particular evenings. And then we'll pick back up in January and begin tasting then. So, hmm, um, what a fun one. Great stuff, folks. Thank you so much for playing. 
as always, uh, it's great to, to spend my Thursday evening with you. I look forward to it all week long. And I walk past bottle after bottle of these in the bar that are now wrapped, thanks to our wonderful team and all of these paper bags with these great little signs on them. So come pick them up and we'll play together further as the Thursdays roll on. Cheers to all of you. Have a great week. Look forward to seeing some of you here if you could make it this way. And if not, I'll see the rest of you again on Thursday. Cheers.